Well, thank you very much for in, inviting me to um, give this uh, presentation uh, from rocket science uh, to uh, a JPL ventilator. That's the, the name of the, the presentation. So I am Leon Alkali. I'm delighted to, to be here and uh, talk to you for the next hour. And um, I'm also listing here my co-authors, my partners uh, in this project, Roger Gibbs, Rob Manning, David Van Buren, and the whole uh, vital team. What I'd like to do is to first start by simply um, giving a little background. I work at the NASA Jet Propulsion Laboratory. It is a um, federally funded research and development center. It's managed and operated uh, by Caltech. JPL is located in the uh, borderline between La Cañada and Pasadena. And um, you see a nice picture here of, of uh, JPL. Uh, our annual business base is approximately uh, in the range of two and a half billion dollars a year. We have uh, over 6,000 employees and we're landlocked. We're one facility, one place, no uh, other satellite centers um, located uh, uh, in here. And um, JPL is known primarily as a center for robotic space exploration. We're not known or recognized for building medical devices. This is something that is um, uh, something I will mention a few times. Um, and, uh, but this uh, picture uh, here shows what we normally do. We, uh, we, we work with NASA. We are a NASA center and we work on space science. You see here to the left, uh, Earth science applications, planetary, Saturn, Mars, we work on exoplanets, we work on astrophysics and fundamental physics, and also we implement for NASA the Deep Space Navigation, uh, uh, Deep Space Network, which provides communication and, um, and navigation services for the agency and through the agency internationally to um, the rest of the world. I'm listing here also uh, for more details if anybody's interested. Uh, I list you a, a website for the JPL strategic implementation plan that tells you a little bit more or a lot more about what JPL normally does and uh, how that aligns to the NASA strategic plan 2018. I also decided to show this iconic picture simply to make the case for what our normal day-to-day -day business is. This is a beautiful picture of the Perseverance uh, uh, rover, nuclear-powered rover, that will launch to Mars on uh, July 17th, just next month. Um, this is what JPL does. This is our bread and butter. I could have put here another picture of the Europa Clipper uh, mission to Europa, Jupiter uh, Moon Europa, or a Psyche mission uh, to um, uh, Iron uh, Asteroid, or Nisar SWAT. Those are kind of our, our uh, projects that we normally work on uh, at JPL. So, Switching from that environment, building robotic systems, autonomous robotic systems that go into, the, uh, uh, into deep space to explore space, today I will be telling you about a true story, uh, a story about a bunch of JPLers, rocket scientists getting together to build a ventilator. And this story begins in mid-March. Two engineers, my, two of my co-authors here, David Van Buren and Rob Manning, uh, met in the cafeteria in, uh, in, in mid-March. And um, they were both moved by the uh, need in the United States at the time, but globally, for um, ventilators, for um, a shortage, simply a shortage of ventilators. And they asked, why can't JPL help or can JPL do something to, uh, to help? Uh, soon thereafter, um, David Van Buren and Rob Manning reached out to me and sent me an email saying, can we talk? And the reason they reached out to me was in part over the last uh, several years, uh, I have been leading small efforts at JPL to look at the cross-section of JPL technology and medical engineering. And we have been collaborating with the City of Hope, with Huntington Memorial Hospital, and many others to see how JPL technology can be of service to medicine and healthcare. So when David Van Buren reached to me, and I heard his, his uh, Kind of vision, I was excited. I reached out to my boss, my direct report, which is David Gallagher, at the uh, associate director at JPL, 
And I told him that I think we should, uh, we should support this. And this was uh, on a Sunday morning. He uh, reached out to me and he said, I think this is a good idea. Let's go for it. And he kindly said, uh, why don't you just keep an eye on them, see what's, how they're doing and, and, and provide some, some oversight. Uh, at, the, at the same time, uh, Dave Gallagher subsequently called uh, Roger Gibbs, uh, a seasoned uh, project manager uh, at JPL and asked if uh, he would like to also be uh, part of this uh, team and be the project manager for the effort. So the four of us uh, remained. Uh, David Gallagher uh, was the, uh, the, uh, the one who approved it and authorized it. But between uh, Roger Gibbs, myself, Rob Manning, and David Van Buren, we provided the overall guidance to this project. And the project started that following Monday, March 16th, day, uh, day one, with a kickoff with Dr. Michael Wurovich from Huntington Hospital in Pasadena coming to JPL and giving uh, uh, a first introduction, a 101 on how the lungs work, how a ventilator uh, it works with the lungs. And I remember him clearly describing that this is a pretty complicated system of machine and body working together as a single system. And there are many nuances, many issues to be studied in that, in that regard. Fast forward 37 days, and uh, uh, lots of JPLers working on this project. Most of them, 90% of us working from home. We can um, uh, claim and, 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 and be proud of uh, having designed two ventilators. You'll uh, see and hear more about it. One a, a pneumatic and one a compressive ventilator. And um, the next day and the 38th day, we uh, had that ventilator shipped, the pneumatic one, to Mount Sinai Hospital in New York, New York City. Uh, for a successful demonstration. And two days later, that ventilator was demonstrated at the White House to the President of the United States. That same day, we applied for EUA authorization, emergency use authorizations with the FDA. And um, about a week or so later, that was uh, approved. So as of today, uh, Caltech, which is the parent organization of JPL, has licensed the vital technology to eight licensees in the United States, and 17 from across the world, including three in Brazil, four in India, one in Mexico, Canada, Australia, Indonesia, Malaysia, Nigeria, Turkey, United Arab Emirates, Egypt, and Armenia. Um, a lot more can be found on this website if anybody's interested in looking at the medicalengineering.jpl.nasa.gov website. Uh, and um, the um, you can, you can please uh, look at that website. But now I'd like to kick this off with a, a video. Hopefully you can all hear this. We are designing an easy and rapidly mass manufacturable ventilator device and it is a crazy project. This crisis is unprecedented in our lives and, uh, and requires precedented action. I'm so amped up. I mean, it really, the adrenaline rush, it's exciting, but it's exhausting. And I think we all just want to do everything we can to try to help. Are you ready? Yeah. I would say the biggest personal challenges that I have myself is uh, I don't have time to sleep. I think what JPL brings to the table is extraordinary talent. It also brings to the table tremendous innovation. The third thing it brings to the table is tremendous focus. The other thing that I felt I see it in our team, and that is a call to duty. I have this talent. I'm an engineer or a scientist. I can do something. We have the potential to save human lives, people that we might know, our neighbors, our families. 
and that intensity um amazing it's amazing and as stressful as it's been for everybody in the last couple of weeks um not one of us can stop Very good. Um, so just um, moving on, uh, since the uh, making of that video, uh, the uh, both compressor and the pneumatic uh, ventilators have received FDA approval for emergency use uh, authorization. So we're very, very proud of that. Uh, I want to switch uh, immediately to give credit to the fabulous team that is the vital team. This is a collage. Uh, composed uh, of uh, more or less all the, the team members uh, who have spent significant time on the project, including the team in the laboratory at the bottom of, the, of this uh, uh, collage. Uh, here's another collage of pictures. This is the, J, the vital leadership team. These are the core team. We actually meet every day uh, for the last three months from uh, 8.30 in the morning and, and four o'clock in the afternoon every single uh, day and uh, we've been uh, we bonded as a team uh, quite a bit and this is the top level leadership team i also wanted to share with you that we uh, have fun from time to time this was the bring your favorite hat to uh to the uh project uh, uh, morning and uh, everybody uh had a lot of fun um so let me go now into a little bit more depth of of, of this project and i'd like to start with strategy. This is kind of my day job is, is to formulate strategy to create partnerships for JPL, working with uh, the associate director for strategic integration. So I often think in terms of uh, what is the strategy forward for a specific project. I've listed the key parameters here. And to be honest, these are not all well thought out through uh, principles from day one, but many of them evolved. Many of them were uh, later on uh, uh, insights, but some of them uh, were quite honestly um, uh, uh, immediately set in motion. And the one, the first one is in particularly true. Uh, we knew from the beginning that we needed help. We needed advice and we went and seeked out that advice from medical doctors, healthcare providers, and, and so on. We knew that we had to engage in a rapid cycle of design and prototype. Uh, and based on these inputs. And uh, we knew that we need to partner. We reached out to a number of different partners through Caltech. For example, Caltech already had and JPL a relationship with Medtronic. We reached out to the leadership of Medtronic and they uh, very unselfishly joined our team to help us in this uh, uh, project. Even though they didn't benefit at all from this partnership and they didn't end up licensing anything from Caltech, they were extraordinary partners in this project. We partnered with other government agencies. We worked closely with NASA headquarters. We worked closely with Department of Homeland Security, FEMA, Human Health Services, uh, the Department of Defense, Department of Energy in particular, Lawrence Livermore National Laboratories, Oak Ridge National Laboratories, and others, and with medical institutions like Mount Sinai Hospital in New York, Huntington uh, Hospital in, in um, Pasadena, but also USC uh, here in Los Angeles. And one of the key decisions we made, which was very critical, was we decided in, in within days at the beginning of the project that we need to do something that will um, uh, obtain FDA approval. We knew that that was critical. We asked a few hospitals if they would uh, take and use uh, devices that were not approved by the FDA, and the answer was clearly no. So we made that, even though that seemed at the time a Herculean effort, can we get FDA approval within uh, weeks or months of this project? And most people said it was impossible to do. But we reached out to um, the head of the um, respiratory uh, division at the FDA, Dr. James Lee, and uh, he uh, joined, in a way, our, our, our efforts early on, helping us out, 
and that was a, an extremely uh, good relation. I want to emphasize the other uh, point, which I think is very important. We knew what we did not know in terms of medical devices and, and healthcare, but we also were very comfortable where, with what we did know. And once requirements are well-defined, our processes that were, were very well established at JPL kick into motion. And we know how to do uh, design reviews. We knew, know how to do requirements flow down and specifications, document things. We're just normally used to a much longer time frame. Here we did in days and weeks what normally take months and years. Peer reviews were, were essential to uh, how we uh, progressed. We had often peer reviews with external advisors coming in, technical, medical, regulatory operations reviews. And we also partnered with uh, companies to help us in design this for manufacturability. We brought in a company called Sanmina, AeroVironment, Supply Frame, and others. Supply chain was a critical element of our project. We had to have answers for how are you going to source the parts? And you'll see a discussion on this. We clearly decided to avoid the legacy ventilator supply chain. And I think we did that quite successfully. And finally, the key element here is, what are we gonna do with this? How are we gonna manufacture? Well, we knew for sure that JPL is not going to manufacture. Well, who will? We don't have the funding to contract out the manufacturers. So we had to go through a process of licensing, a global no-fee license, which you'll hear more about. So let me start with uh, this story with uh, bringing in our medical advisors. You see Michael Gurevich here uh, facing. Um, it, Michael Gurevich is in the, in the, in the middle here uh, with, a, with a badge. And um, he's actually looking at the screen. He's looking at Matt Levin from Mount Sinai Hospital. Uh, so we had two robots. You see in the background there, uh, uh, Stacy Boland, also on the on the second robot, and to the right, Mike Johnson is is uh, uh, standing by. So we brought in doctors, Mike Gorovich and uh, Dr. Levin and others, to uh, advise us. This is a beautiful picture of the two doctors talking and looking at each other and discussing uh, our design. We had to, from the beginning, establish what is the medical need. We were listening to our doctors. We had a case where Matt Levin was. Uh, joined our meeting after just walking through the ICU at Mount Sinai and looking at all the display numbers on the um, uh, ventilators in the ICU and coming and telling us what he's seeing in terms of uh, the, the requirements and uh, the needs. So going back to March 2020, we were looking at a very dire situation. We were looking at a shortage of ventilators, not just in the United States, but across the world. I remember a very interesting conversation with the um, president of Mount Sinai Hospital, Dr. David Rich, uh, and myself and Rob Manning. And um, we knew that our ventilators would not make it on time to uh, meet the peak uh, of the pandemic in New York on the front line. And I was somewhat apologetic saying, you know, these uh, devices will not be there in time for New York uh, peak. And uh, each one of them, including Dr. Scott Friedman and Matt Levin and Dr. Rich, told us, don't worry about New York. Uh, even if it comes later, there could be a second wave. And then there's the Southern Hemisphere. They were worried about Africa, India, Brazil. Uh, and those concerns, as you may know, um, remain uh, today. But they were very generous in their thinking and uh, advising us to think broadly and think uh, globally not just the United States and not just New York. So the JPL Vital Project set out to design and develop a limited function ventilator, we'll hear more about that, that could meet a large fraction of the COVID-19 patient needs while being quickly manufacturable using readily available parts. I want to uh, bring in for a moment here just um, uh, one of our colleagues, uh, Eric Bailey. Uh, he did a fantastic job on the project um, using and recreating the models that were available uh, from across the, the country and, and across the world. This was a very uh, important element. We had our internal modeling expert uh, who was able to recreate the models, run the models on our computers, and give us a lot of uh, scenarios for what could happen. 
Here you see a, the error bars at the beginning for the predictions were pretty large. In this case, the, the different um, um, uh, cases of contact reduction was uh, modeled. And in the worst case, the number of uh, deaths, potentially uh, cumulative uh, uh, number of deaths in the United States alone uh, were potentially going to be extraordinarily high. And the need for ventilators could have been extraordinarily high. So we were watching this on a week by week basis, even as the situation improved, even as ventilators uh, later on were being shared across uh, state boundaries, we were keeping track of all these models and recreating them internally. This helped us a great deal as we moved uh, forward. In this graph, I kind of uh, show a little bit where we saw the, the need for the vital device. We were told and by our doctors uh, that we don't want to replace the high-end ventilators that go into the ICU, but that there was a surge, there was a bottleneck occurring for a number of patients who are not in the ICU but could still use a, a high-end a, a, a ventilator um, to uh, reduce the uh, um, impact of, of the, uh, uh, the COVID um, uh, uh, symptoms. And so this is the range that we were targeting, a simpler ventilator than the uh, full-blown uh, ICU ventilator, but still highly uh, capable ventilator that requires uh, intubation. I want to bring in now uh, uh, Stacy Bolin, who is a very uh, accomplished system engineer, primarily uh, worked on earth science applications. And um, she was brought in as, as uh, one to take on two uh, important topics. One is the medical use. How will this ventilator be used by the medical um, uh, community? And the other one is the operational aspect of the ventilator. These were again two topics that we were not familiar with and somebody had to become familiar, not an expert, but to be able to talk to the doctors, talk to the healthcare uh, providers uh, and so on. So this is a, a, a statement, patients uh, suffering from the uh, ARDS or acute respiratory distress syndrome caused by uh, the, the, the COVID-19, those were our, our main uh, focus. And this subset of patients is generally characterized by needing low to moderate tidal volume and high breathing rate and a wide range of positive end expiratory pressure or PEEP. Uh, until uh, a, a few months ago, none of us knew what PEEP means or what PIP is and PEEP and how to differentiate it. We became somewhat familiar, we're not experts, but um, very often we are asked what is the mode of operation and it's listed here as the volume targeted, pressure limited and time limited uh, ventilator. The intended patient has the following attributes. We're looking at an adult patient uh, with a body weight of, of greater than 50 kilograms. The patient is sedated and intubated and uh, relatively stable vital, vital signs. Um, and uh, the patient may or may not be exhibiting spontaneous breathing efforts. So this is a pretty sick uh, patient who needs uh, attention. We then brought in uh, also another expert at JPL, uh, Brett Kennedy. Brett Kennedy is a world expert in uh, robotics and mobility systems, rovers, and so on. And that is his primary uh, expertise. But in this case, on this project, he was focused on requirements and specifications. And this was a very, very critical task. We had to be able to translate all this medical requirements and language into a specification that we know we can understand and we can then build to. So Brett was in charge of defining those requirements, making them uh, available in a human readable form so that non-experts can also read and, and, uh, and review them. And, um, and also in the, in, as we progressed, those had to be updated, maintained, those had to be then validated, but also as we move more towards licensing, any changes that we recommend to the licensees had to be documented and managed. This is an example of some of the specifications. There's a whole document behind this, but this shows some of the numbers that we actually got from the doctors in terms of the 
uh, uh, FiO2 in terms of the PEEP, the PIP, the, the backup rate, the tidal volume. And within these parameters, we designed the, um, the ventilator to actually address the corner cases, the extreme cases of high volume and pressure and, and, and so on. And these are the, just the top level specifications for this um, quite capable uh, uh, ventilator. So I want to bring in now uh, one of our stars, uh, Mike Johnson, who is the lead engineer for, for, this, uh, uh, for the ventilator designs. And in this collage, I simply show that uh, how rapidly we moved, or in, in general, how we moved from whiteboard designs to a breadboard to um, actual capturing uh, a specific uh, design right away in the laboratory. This is an example. We actually uh, had to borrow this uh, lung simulator uh, from one of our partners, from Huntington and, and, and also from Santa Monica. You see this on the bench here. Mike Johnson is, is looking at it. This lung simulator, we actually couldn't afford. We were looking to uh, uh, whether we can buy it or not, but we actually said, why don't we uh, uh, loan it uh, from, uh, from our partners? And we actually uh, did that. Um, then we checked in with our doctors. You see the somewhat uh, puzzled face of Matt Levin in, uh, on the robot here, uh, and uh, Mike Gurvich showing him uh, some of the, 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 the features and they're reviewing our breadboard uh, design. And then after some tribulations, some iterations, you see the exuberant uh, David Van Vuren, and uh, it works. This was our first uh, a breadboard that actually operated the, uh, the ventilator in a, in a, a breadboard uh, configuration. Now, to do all this, we had to have a extremely capable uh, test bed and uh, VNV or validation and, and verification lead engineer, and that was and is Michelle Easter. So she had a tremendously uh, challenging job. She was um, the lead engineer for the test bed and for testing, but she also had to bridge the, uh, the communication and the interface between the design group that you see in this, um, in this picture, but also the production team that was looking at how are we going to manufacture these ventilators. She also had to be in charge of the VNV test plans and procedures and how this ventilator will be tested at Mount Sinai and at UCLA. She also had to assist and provide test data to the uh, regulatory process and submit it um, as part of the uh, FDA uh, submittal process. And right now, uh, she also has to uh, support the licensing of the technology to industries or companies across the world, which may require some additional testing um, at the uh, at the test bed. It was interesting. I asked uh, Michelle to provide me some inputs on what were some of the the challenges that she faced during this project, and uh, you see them here in terms of high pressure, fast-paced project, high levels of stress at work and at home. Uh, the environment tested each individual's personal limits regarding physical comfort and communication and stress management skills. We don't always think about these things, but they were important. Multiple constraints made um, locking down the design was, was quite difficult. The part selection was a back and forth. If the prototype was using a part that the production team was saying, well, we can't get a hold of this part, the design team had to go back and find an alternate uh, part in the, in the prototype. So there was a, a, a go back and forth between the design team and the production team that was quite a challenge. But ultimately, we built the prototypes. You see Patrick DeGrosse here holding our first um, uh, prototype uh, design. And uh, moving on now to the supply chain. Uh, part of the supply chain uh, team and the lead of the team was Arby Karapetian from JPL, here shown with a shirt with a NASA logo on it. And um, he is, and his team did a fantastic job in doing what we normally don't do, and that is supply chain analysis, sourcing parts, and making sure that these ventilators can be manufactured uh, in volume uh, uh, and at scale. So let me show you a few things uh, that uh, Arby provided as part of the, the challenge. 
So when the vital project started, all international shipping lines had been suspended and there were no supplies coming into the United States. All domestic and offshore manufacturing plants had shut down. Most supplier and retailers had shut, shut down due to the pandemic as well. It was during this time that the team of 10 JPLers came together to um, address this problem. And their task was to study and probe the supply chain for parts to design and prototype the, uh, uh, the ventilator. And um, I also will add to this that um, even the, the United States State Department was tracking down the US supply chain of the parts that were going into the legacy ventilators. So the interference with legacy ventilators was not only something we were avoiding, but it was also uh, a strategic uh, asset that the United States government was carefully uh, keeping track of. So our guidelines were uh, to not use the supply chain of the current ventilators, use um, uh, available uh, parts that are available in large quantities in the US within a period of four to six weeks. I apologize for that. Uh, use generic and uh, uh, parts and allow for substitution. Use compatible parts with oxygen for oxygen uh, uh, use with oxygen. Uh, also reduce the number of parts as much as possible. You'll see that we succeeded in that. And um, when possible, use multiple instances of the same part. And um, use parts that are uh, designed, uh, that are assembled using simple hand tools by a, a relatively untrained uh, worker. And we did provide such a list in the bill of materials that we have, but we used a lot of help from outside, from companies like Sanmina, Supply Frame, Aerovironment. And we did succeed and found no showstoppers in meeting all these uh, requirements. Um, and uh, the above companies did provide a minor list of possible improvements, uh, which were passed on uh, to uh, JPL. Uh, uh, and uh, JPL did invest in a mold injection um, a part that uh, JPL paid for, and that part is available to our licensees for, for use. So let me now switch to uh, Stacy Boland. And uh, again, I mentioned earlier on the uh, medical use and the, uh, um, the patient definition that she led, but also very importantly, it was the operational aspect that was critical in the work that she was um, uh, leading uh, with her team. We had to understand how this will be used, how the ventilator will be accepted or used by the, the healthcare providers. And this was very challenging. We had to understand the alarms, the labelings, the portability, the movement, the use, and, and so on. And this was, there are a lot of standards, but there are also a lot of unwritten rules and standards that the team uh, had to understand. And um, she became extremely knowledgeable uh, in this uh, field quite, uh, quite quickly. And Stacy also used something that we have at JPL called the studio. This is led by Dan Goods and his team. The studio is an in-house design um, facility that is composed of uh, people who are primarily designers, um, artists, um, uh, and, and uh, skilled in um, industrial design. They're not the traditional JPL engineers, but they have design capabilities in-house and they joined the team and pro pro provided a tremendous uh, amount of uh, help. I'm showing some of the, the, their designs and some of their uh, efforts. Uh, they provided the uh, interface and human factors design. You see some of the early sketches here that they uh, provided and the final implementation. They were also important to document the whole project. Dan Goods and his team were going around taking pictures, movies, documenting the whole experience. They also worked with Stacy uh, on a very important task in providing the instructional and educational material that we hand over to the um, licensees and to the healthcare uh, uh, providers of this device. A huge effort. And I would also add that we also brought in our advanced ops uh, uh, labs teams that also did videotaping of the assembly instructions and of the operational use of both the pneumatic and the compressor design. And uh, as part of the, uh, as I mentioned, part of the effort was to define the uh, operability of the ventilator. 
uh, what, how to set it up, how to test it, how to calibrate it. And this was part of the instructional material that the team uh, developed. After all this huge amount of effort, we took a family picture. You see David Van Buren uh, in the middle and uh, Michelle and, and, and Mike Johnson and, and, and others uh, in this team. You also see a beautiful smiling face of Matt Levin and Mike Gorovich, uh, happy with the, the ventilator uh, design. This was the uh, uh, compressor. This is, I think, the pneumatic design at the time. And then we had to package this uh, design carefully uh, before we shipped it to Mount Sinai. This is uh, also more something that uh, we do when we ship uh, flight hardware and we treated it almost uh, like it was flight hardware, very carefully packaging uh, the design. And uh, we use the white glove service to ship it to New York. That means it, it was uh, hand carried and never left the, uh, the site of the, uh, uh, the attendee even during the flight, and uh, it was delivered safely to Mount Sinai and back. At Mount, at Mount Sinai, a group of doctors tested uh, the, uh, in this case, the pneumatic uh, uh, ventilator and uh, provided us with a del del delightful, historic, uh, iconic picture of the, uh, you see here, the uh, dummy, uh, test dummy uh, with a lung simulator, and they validated the, um, the ventilator uh, design. While the, the design, the ventilator was um, in uh, New York at Mount Sinai, we got a call that uh, NASA headquarters would like to also showcase the uh, ventilator at NASA headquarters. And uh, from uh, New York, it went to Washington, DC. And then while in DC, we got um, word that the president of the United States would also like to uh, see uh, the ventilator design. And this was, uh, uh, showcased at the White House, together with two other projects that NASA was working on as part of the NASA at uh, Work uh, program. But I think it uh, made us all proud. And I put here um, a, a nice uh, caption here of uh, from the whiteboard to the White House in, in 40 days. So let me now switch um, a little bit uh, into the, uh, towards the ending of this presentation. And that is to give a lot of credit and recognition to Chris Yonker and his team. Uh, it, it seemed literally like a, a mission impossible. For JPL, we've never done this before. We never had a need to, and never before has JPL obtained FDA uh, license, e emergency use authorization or not. And uh, Chris and his team were handed off that, that uh, mission impossible to, um, to get this done. And, um, and it was done in, in, a, in a very short and remarkable uh, uh, amount of uh, uh, time. And um, Chris provided a, a list of all those who helped in his team, both uh, internally to JPL and externally. And I do list here people from the FDA who definitely helped a lot, including from NASA headquarters, J.D. Polk, and Susan Bain from, from USC. But it was a huge effort. A lot of people contributed uh, and it was done very systematically. JPL engineers know very well how to test. We know very well how to document. We know very well how to do failure modes, effects and analysis, which is part of what the FDA required and risk assessment and so on. So we knew how to do things from an engineering point of view, but it was a terribly hard uh, challenge to understand exactly what was needed and make sure the FDA gets what it needs. These are the two uh, uh, listings from the uh, FDA for both the pneumatic and the compressor design that we uh, proudly have uh, in hand. After getting the, uh, the um, FDA approval, we wanted to then also test the compressor design because we did test the pneumatic one at Mount Sinai and we did ship it to UCLA here at the Ronald Reagan Medical Center in the laboratory of Professor Dr. Tisha Wang, and they validated the compressor uh, design uh, as well. After this, we actually sent the same compressor design to Mount Sinai again for a second, uh, uh, a first time validation of the compressor design at Mount Sinai, and that also went very well. And coming to an end uh, to this presentation, several, uh, uh, about a month or so ago, we, we uh, came to a juncture to, uh, in our project thinking, 
what is the best way to transition this from JPL to a manufacturing uh, capability? And uh, we clearly knew that JPL will not be the one manufacturing, but how do we pick a partner? And JPL is very familiar with how to uh, pick partners for a space mission, where we own the budget, we know what we want, and we can pick a contractor to do this mission or that mission. But when it came to manufacturing medical devices, we had no experience. So there were a few options that we looked into, including open source and including licensing. And we opted um, uh, for good reasons to go with a targeted licensing, but making a broad announcement uh, to the, the world for uh, a no fee global license. And I'm listing here the team at JPL and Caltech who um, uh, worked effectively to get the word out. It did help that this was demonstrated at the White House and NASA headquarters and so on. And a lot of media coverage uh, um, followed. So we received about 300 participants into an open call of question Q&A session. From there, we received 100, thereabouts 100 proposals. We did specify exactly what proposals should contain. And out of those 100 uh, proposals, you see a demographics here, about half of them from the United States and half of them from the rest of the world, particularly notice that uh, a lot from Brazil and India, but a lot of other countries uh, all applied uh, um, for the license. We ended up picking, as of today, 25 licensees, eight in the United States and 17 from companies across the world, including Brazil, India, Australia, Canada, Mexico, the United Arab Emirates, Egypt, Turkey, Malaysia, Indonesia, Nigeria, and Armenia. And we're still getting uh, a few more uh, interested parties to, to license um, the technology. If you want to see the exact names of the companies, they're available on the website. Uh, but so far, 25 licensees uh, for this technology, uh, we consider uh, a tremendous uh, success. And I will end this session now with a family portrait of the vital ventilators. And thank you all for your patience and your attention to this quite long presentation of 45 minutes. <laughs>